Good evening, everyone. This, 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 I think this is better. Can you hear me all right? Yes. I don't need this. Buenas tardes, good evening everyone, and welcome to Instituto Cervantes New York, um, a very strong supporter of the World Voices Festival for many years now. And it is already a tradition to host a session on what is more or less going on in the, we don't have a very good word to unify our countries, the country where Spanish is spoken. And besides we have, um, Catalan writer today because in Spain there are four official languages and Catalan literature is very important and, and is as strong as any other European literature and has its stature of itself. And uh, that is why we have a, a Catalan writer also here today. What this is going to be is a conversation, an informal conversation among them. Um, and I'm going to ask a few questions and then we will explore a number of, of topics. Uh, but I am going first to introduce our guests in alphabetical order and not to complicate my life, I'm just going to read the biographies from the official brochure. So, all right. So first I have with me, next to me, Marcelo Figueres. Manuel de Lopez. <laughs> All right. Manuel de Lope, next to the translator, they are going to speak um, in English and occasionally they chose to in, in Spanish or Catalan and we have a translator today. Manuel de Lope is one of the most respected living Spanish authors. In 1969, after being jailed under Franco's dictatorship, he went into exile. First in Geneva and then in the south of France and returned to Madrid in 1993. In 1978, he published his first novel, Albertina, in El País de los Garamantes, thus commencing one of the most treasured and significant careers in modern Spanish literature. The Wrong Blood was translated into English in 2010. You can see the cover of the book at the back of the brochure. And uh, I will begin by asking Manuel to briefly, in the terms that he wishes, introduce himself and uh, his approach or his idea of literature. Buenas tardes. ¿Cómo está? Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias al Instituto Cervantes por por haberme invitado a este acto. Good afternoon, and I'd like to thank the Cervantes Institute for having invited me to this round table. Y la organización del Pen Club por todo lo que ha organizado la ciudad de Nueva York. And I'd like to thank the Pen. Uh, club for everything that it has organized in the city. Eh, yo nací en Burgos, en una ciudad de Castilla la Vieja, en el norte de España. I was born in Burgos, in the city of Castilla la Vieja, in north, northern Spain. Una pequeña ciudad conservadora, provincial. A very small, provincial and conservative city. Eh, estudié en Madrid, a los 15 años fui a estudiar a Madrid. I studied in Madrid, I went to study in Madrid when I was 15. Y estudié ciencias económicas y ingenier ingeniería. Studying economics and engineering. No, yo no estaba destinado a, a ser escritor. My destiny at the time was not to be a writer. Era una carrera de técnica, de, de ciencias. I was, uh, I was studying a science career, technical. Sí, eh, Como ha dicho Eduardo Lago, el director del instituto, en el año 1969. As Eduardo Lago, the director of this institute, has just said, in 1969. Eh, fui al exilio a Francia. I exiled to France. Y abandoné mis estudios. Yo nunca, nunca terminé los estudios de, de Madrid. Abandoning my studies. I never finished my studies in Madrid. Y por alguna razón misteriosa empecé a escribir. But uh, for some mysterious reason, I started writing. I, I don't really know why. Y envié mi primera novela, se la envié a un editor catalán en Barcelona, a Carlos Barral. I sent my first novel by mail to a uh, Catalan uh, publisher in Barcelona, Carlos. Carlos Barral. Carlos Barral. Y um, al cabo de seis o siete meses, bastante tarde, yo ya casi lo había olvidado. And much later, maybe six, seven months later, quite much later, I had almost forgotten about it. Me respondió que quería conocerme y publicar la novela. He responded and asked to meet me because he wanted to publish my book. Y bueno, pues 
a veces he pensado que si yo, si esta primera novela no hubiera sido aceptada por un editor, yo no hubiera escrito una segunda. There were times when I, when I thought about it, and I think had this first book not been accepted by a publisher, I wouldn't have written a second book. Pero la realidad es que he continuado de esa manera. But I've continued writing. Y ahora mi no me concibo de otra forma que siendo escritor, que siendo lo que soy. Mi personalidad se ha estructurado en torno a eso. And today I can't think of myself as anything but a writer. My whole personality, my character has been built around that. Eh, ya no soy joven, ya no voy a cambiar. I'm not young, so I'm not going to change anymore. No paso la palabra al so, director. Uh, the director. Well, our next guest uh, to introduce this time, I think I'm not wrong, he's sitting next to me, Marcelo Figueras from Argentina. He is a screenwriter, filmmaker, and journalist. His novels include El Muchacho Peronista, El Espía del Tiempo, La Batalla del Calentamiento, Aquarium, and Antarctica, which he adapted into a screenplay. The film won several prizes, including people's favorite at the Vancouver Festival and best script at La Habana. Other screenwriter credits include Rosario Tijeras, with gold ticket sales records in Colombia, and uh, Las Viudas de los Jueves. Uh, I will ask you, Marcelo, first of all, welcome, and it's a great honor to have you here um, to, to speak about yourself in this double facet of your personality as a, a writer and as a filmmaker from Argentina with an additional dimension, which is that you honor a very long tradition of uh, prestigious Latin American writers who choose Barcelona as a permanent residence. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, well, uh, thank you, Eduardo, for, for the invitation. Thank you all for coming here, even though it's a, it's a lovely evening and prone to be everywhere else drinking beer. Then, but Thank you for coming anyway. Uh, I find it really awkward to talk about my work, so uh, I would like to start by a little context, you know, in a way that trying uh, uh, to define uh, the, the generation, uh, the, the present generation of, of writers in Argentina. Uh, I guess many of you know that during the 70s, uh, not only Argentina, but many Latin American countries, from El Salvador to Chile to Uruguay to Brazil to uh, 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 were under military dictatorships uh, that were really, really hard uh, against lots of people, but uh, mainly among, and between them and writers and, and filmmakers and, and, and uh, people from the theater and even well, well yeah, I guess you know that. And uh, the many great, really great Argentinian writers were killed uh, back then. Uh, back, back, just two names: Rodolfo Walsh and Haroldo Conti, uh, just uh, as an example. So, in, in a way, this this crippled the the the, the, the flow, the normal flow uh, that happens between a generation of writers and the next one. Uh, the writers that, that, that weren't killed or exiled, for, for example, Julio Cortázar, uh, the writers that remain in Argentina, many, uh, I don't know, consciously or not, many, in a, in a way, uh, began writing with some sort of self-censorship. So, uh, for us, young people that, that, that were looking for some kind, kind of guidance in that uh, black night, uh, that literature, the, the, the things that many writers wrote during those uh, dark years meant not a big deal to us. Uh, so uh, even after the end of the military dictatorship in 1983, it took uh, us many, many years uh, to begin writing about what happened. Uh, Kamchatka, the, the novel of mine that's been translated into English, uh, was one of, of the first, and it, it's a novel at, at the beginning of this century. Uh, I mean, uh, there are 17 years uh, between the end of the dictatorship and, and, and this novel in particular, and many other novels. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, it took us uh, quite a, a lot of time uh, because we we have no real guidance of uh, writers who we really admired. Uh, Cortázar was far away. Borges was one of a kind. Well, and. Uh, Uh, we we did what we could uh, without uh, the, the living masters, without uh, um, uh, without uh, something that guided us through, through this process. But, but luckily, uh, not only my, my generation, but even younger writers uh, uh, nowadays are writing uh, not realism, uh, but they are not afraid anymore to. Uh, grasp uh, the, the, the drama uh, that uh, meant and still means uh, living in, in Argentina and in Latin America during uh, the, the last uh, 30 years. And I've talked too much. I mean. <laughs> but, but you know what? I, I, we all woke up to a very sad piece of news today. The great Argentinian writer Ernesto Sabato passed away tonight at 99. And I, since you were talking about what happened with the dictatorship, he wrote that, uh, apart from being a great novelist, he wrote that report, which remains. Would you say a few words in homage to your um, his great Argentinian writer? Uh, his books uh, were precisely one of the few uh, that we read in the dark. Uh, uh, informes sobre ciegos and, and sobre héroes y tumbas and, 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 and uh, Abadón el Exterminador were were uh, novels that, that helped us uh, to, to, to begin to understand that there were ways uh, to talk even when you're not allowed to. Uh, so, so it really meant uh, for us, but uh, he's in many ways the, the exception that confirms the rule. Uh, Next, I'm going to introduce a Mexican writer. This just shows the richness and the diversity of, of this. I don't know how to include everything in one single word, but the Hispanic word, we could say, it doesn't cover completely other realms like Catalan. Enrique Serna is a Mexican author and screenwriter, so we have a topic of conversation there with the relationship between film and literature. His collection of short stories, Amores de Segunda Mano, is widely regarded as a milestone in the genre. Gabriel Garcia Marquez included one of his short stories in an anthology of Mexican fiction, Cambio. Serna has received the Premio Mazatlán de Literatura for his historical novel El Seductor de la Patria, the Premio Narrativa Colima for his novel Ángeles del Abismo, and the prize Antonin Artaud for his erotic work, La Sangre Reguida. He has been translated into French, Italian, English, and Portuguese. And I would just like, uh, uh, Enrique, si quieres hablar un poco de ti mismo, individualmente, y, y también desde la perspectiva de lo que significa ser un escritor mexicano. I asked him to ask about himself as a writer individually, and also what it means for him to be representing today in Mexican literature. Okay, well, I am not a very fluent speaker. Uh, and if I don't find the right words, I will ask the help of our translator. And <laughs> I started uh, when I was very young, reading uh, fantastic uh, short stories. My uh, during my adolescence, no? uh, my favorite writers were uh, Lovecraft, Edgar Allan Poe, H.G. Wells, the Italian Dino Busatti. But uh, later, when I began to discover the double moral of the, uh, of the people, the, when I began to mm, mm, discover all the forbidden pleasures of life, and when I became an adult, no, I developed uh, uh, a new <laughs> uh, sympathy for the authors that, that have a uh, studied the uh, cynical uh, way of uh, uh, showing the duplicity of the human condition, uh, like uh, uh, Baudelaire, uh, Billiard de Lilladam, uh, or the Cuban uh, Virgilio Piñera. 
uh, Ruben Fonseca, the Brazilian writer that I admire very much, and uh, uh, some others. Then I, I became uh, uh, being a, a writer that uh, uh, has developed the uh, black humor, uh, very acid and uh, satirical, but my models uh, are not the satirist uh, moralist like uh, uh, Juvenal, you know, to give an example of the classic uh, Latin writers, but uh, a, a kind of satire where the author uh, uh, is always uh, criticized by himself, you know? uh, because I think that I am a part of the uh, fictitious world that I am describing. Uh, I don't pretend to be moral morally superior to my to my characters and well the only book that, that I have uh, published in English uh, uh, fear, uh, fear of Animals is a thriller but it's also a satire of the intellectual circles of Mexico uh, I try to make an analogy between the conduct of the uh, criminal gangs uh, and the conduct of the uh, literary mafias <laughs> because I think that there are many points of contact between them uh, because uh, in Mexico we had a dictatorship uh, for 70 years a dictatorship of, of, of a party the revolutionary institutional party uh, whose name is uh, an oxymoron because it's impossible to be revolutionary and institutional at the same time. And uh, this party uh, uh, was uh, like a, an hereditary monarchy, no? where the, the, the president the designed the, the, his, success, his successor, and uh, for many years uh, nobody could uh, uh, change uh, this uh, political system. Uh, Mario Vargas Llosa told once that Mexico was the perfect, the perfect dictatorship because uh, the PRI uh, uh, was more old in power than the Communist Party of the, of the Soviet Union. Then my novel takes place uh, during the last years of this dictatorship when the Mexican government had uh, uh, tried to to buy the, the, the volunteer of, of many artists and writing uh, and uh, writers and uh, painters offering them uh, fellowships, uh, very splendid. You know? uh, and then uh, the intellectual world, the, intellectual, the intellectuals and the artists became a uh, political uh, clientele of this, uh, I don't know if, if I use the word, right? clientele? Okay. Well, of the of the government. Don't, this this was very uh, paradoxical because this party, this, this system, destroyed the public education in Mexico, and now we are a country with uh, uh, 110 million people, where only uh, one million read newspapers. This is a, a, a educative catastrophe. And then in a world where there are so many analphabets or functional analphabets, uh, we have an intellectual class uh, with all the advantage that don't, don't have to sell books to, 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 be, to, to live because they have uh, very good fellowships or uh, they work as functionaries of the government. And this is an operation of cooptation of all the intellectual class. Then, that was the reason that I made this analogy in my novel. When I published it in Mexico, it provoked a big scandal. I was insulted in the review Vuelta, directed by Octavio Paz, because there were, there were many jokes in my novel about uh, Octavio Paz. <laughs> but then, uh, but also I had uh, a good uh, support uh, from uh, another group of independent writers and then this provoked a, a polemic. No? Some critics told me that uh, this was a uh, Romana Clay no? for, uh, for selling it in French no? uh, and uh, 
therefore uh, uh, no foreigner reader could understand it but now it has been translated to some languages and I have uh, 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 discovered that uh, the Mexican intellectual world is not so different uh, as the intellectual worlds of many other countries and that's why uh, all the readers uh, in France and Italy or here in the United States can distinguish these conducts because I even try to uh, make portraits of caricatures of uh, intellectuals uh, particularly but uh, of, of, the, of the conduct that I have seen no? it's very common in Mexico when we, we are presenting a book no? that the uh, presentators uh, praise the book they say beautiful things about it and then they, they, uh, some two, two hours later they go to the bar and they start destroying the same book that they praised before <laughs> but this double language is, is I think that uh, is normal in the political world but shouldn't exist in the intellectual world because if we can't sustain in public the same thing that we say in private then we are uh, deceiving our, our readers and, and our world becomes weak no? well that's uh, uh, this novel I, I wouldn't like to, to speak about the others because they are not translated into English Thank you Enrique so uh, Teresa Solana is a translator from Barcelona she directed the National Translation Center in Spain for seven years. Now she devotes her time to writing her own novels and translating them into Spanish, which is one of the aspects that I think are most interesting about your work. A Not So Perfect Crime, her first novel, won the 2007 Brigada 21 Prize for Best Noir in Catalan and A Shortcut to Paradise. Her second was shortlisted for the 2008 Salambo Prize for the best novel in Canada. Her words have been translated into several languages. I guess that in the question that I addressed uh, to each of you in your cases, uh, approach yourself, introduce yourself in the terms that you would like to do, but take into account your very special situation of being a writer who lives in two languages or between two languages. Okay. Uh, bona tarda, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Eduardo, for inviting me to participate in the round table. And thank you very much, uh, Pen, for, for um, inviting me to participate in this uh, wonderful uh, festival. So, uh, <coughs> yes, I am, I am Catalan. Uh, I was born in Barcelona. And I think I, I have to, to, be, to begin to telling you that I, I grew up uh, learning Catalan from my family, but studying uh, in Spanish at the school. Because I was uh, 13 years old when, the, when Franco, the, the dictatorship, uh, died. And uh, during the Franco dictatorship, uh, Catalan uh, was uh, persecuted. Mm -hmm. So uh, my family is, is a, they are Catalan speakers, and I probably belong to the last generation of Catalan people that grow up in one language at home, uh, but learn other language in, in a school. So I am bilingual. Hmm? But I had to, to, to I, I, I learned uh, the two languages uh, in, in different contexts. Hmm? So uh, when, when I went to the, to the university to study philosophy, I, I, I made my studies in Spanish as well, but because uh, the teachers teach in, Sp in, in Spanish, and I have to, to write my essays in, in Spanish. So the Spanish was uh, the, the language of my academic papers, of my essays, etc. 
and it was the language that I begin uh, to to work as a as a professional translator. Right? I translate from English and French now into Catalan and Spanish, but not at the beginning. At the beginning, I only translated into Spanish. But then I come. I, I came back to the university to study classical languages, and then uh, my teachers uh, teach only in Catalan. So I have another approach to Catalan. And Catalan was not only my, my familiar language, hmm, a language that my parents uh, cannot uh, read or, or write, hmm, but also uh, an, a, a language, uh, um, the, the language that I write, also my academic paper. So my relationship with Catalan changed. And in fact, when I decided to, to start writing, uh, I didn't realize that uh, my choice of to write in Catalan uh, was a political choice. Uh, to me, it was uh, natural to, to start writing Catalan uh, when I, when I, cuando conseguí, cuando, uh, when I was able to, to express myself in Catalan in writing, hmm? not only in the in oral context. So, uh, well, in my case, I write uh, crime fiction, hmm? but I'm not really uh, interested in, in crime or in, in murder. I use a crime to 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 uh, to have a, to make to make a portrait a critic and satiric portrait of my society I think like like you that. and uh, I am very worried about uh, the gap that exists in Catalonia between the literary Catalan and the Catalan that people uses to speak uh, in the street. So in my novels, I, I try to, to recover this popular, this impure, impure, impure uh, Catalan, uh, not perfect, and, 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 and just to give my, my characters uh, a voice. Mm -hmm. So in my novels, my characters are not are not uh, only uh, people from the university, teachers, members of the uh, cultural elitism, but other kind of people. And this is one of the reasons that I decided to write not crime fiction, but uh, uh, novels with the sharp of crime fiction, because I'm interested in to arrive uh, to readers, I'm interested in to have readers, huh? and particularly the last the last novel that has been translated into English, A Shortcut to Paradise, is also uh, a satire on the literary war in Catalonia. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so <laughs> it's a thriller as well. <laughs> and <laughs> well, in my case, in my case, the 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 answer of the critics was uh, just to to uh, to ignore sorry to ignore the the novel or to publish a review uh, expla explaining in the title who was the murder and in the review at the end of the of the novel no so, yes yes. <laughs> yes, it's quite the revenge. <laughs> critics don't like that to be criticism. No? So, so uh, it seems to me that from what we heard, the four of you are very strongly con constrained by the political and the historical conditions you have to live in. So I'm going to, in different ways, of course. So I'm going to ask Manuel de Lope. Whose last novel, *The Wrong Blood*, has been just translated into English? 
he goes back to a very difficult time of Spanish history, which is that of the Civil War. So uh, it, this novel was written quite a few years ago, but my question for you is, um, now that we are living in a, in a democracy for over 30 years in Spain, is the imagination free or do you feel constrained to go back and explore that wound of the past? Bueno, la imaginación siempre es libre, no tiene más condicionamientos que lo de la propia personalidad. Imagination is always free, it's only limited by your own personality. Esta novela, La sangre ajena, ambientada en la guerra civil, yo la escribí hace ya, eh, apareció en español hace 12 años, creo. The novel, The Wrong Blood, I wrote about 12 years ago, I think that's when it was published in Spanish. Luego ha habido un un florecimiento de novelas o de escritos sobre el entorno de la guerra civil. After that, there were a lot of novels written about the civil war. There was kind of like a boom. Pero mi interés en el tema era anterior. But I was interested in the subject before that. No es una novela histórica. This is not a historical novel. No es una novela política tampoco. It is not a political novel either. Es, es una historia de dos mujeres sometidas a situaciones extremas. It is the story of two women that are experiencing extreme situations. Que provocan una destrucción de personalidad. Which destroys them, each. Como una sobrevive y otra no sobrevive a esa aniquilación de personalidad. One survives and the other one does not survive this destruction. La guerra únicamente ofrece el entorno propicio para, para esas situaciones extremas. The war only provides the proper background but the, but, uh, for the situation Escogí, and for their, for their experiences. Escogí ambientarla en el País Vasco. I chose to, to have it occur in the Basque country Porque conozco la tierra. because I know the land. La mitad de mi familia es del País Vasco. Half of my family is from the Basque country. Y también porque la guerra civil allí fue extremadamente rápida y violenta. Also because the civil war in the Basque country was very quick and very violent. Se trataba de controlar la frontera y las operaciones militares duraron apenas dos meses y una destrucción muy grande. The point was to control the borders, so the civil war lasted two months. It was very violent and hard. Y para para el relato yo necesitaba este tipo de de velocidad y de destrucción. I needed that type of speed and destruction in order to tell my story. Pero quiero decir que yo he vivido las circunstancias políticas del franquismo, creo que soy el mayor de esta mesa. I I just wanted to tell you I did live through the the politics of Franco. I think I'm the oldest person at this table. Que afectaron mi vida personal. And that affected me personally. Mis estudios y mi vida en general. Yo regresé a España ya con 45 años. Because it affected my study and my personal life, I came back to Spain when I was 45 already. Pero nadie, ningún lector, lo podría adivinar por mis novelas. Although no one, no reader, could guess that by reading my novels. Mi primera novela se publicó apenas había muerto Franco. My first novel was published as soon as Franco had died, shortly after. Y es una novela íntima de de carácter emocional. It's a very intimate, emotional novel. Muy lejos de lo que yo había vivido en aquellos años. Quite, quite far from what I had experienced in at that time, so I don't think anybody could guess that I experienced this. Por eso digo que la imaginación reclama sus derechos. That's why I say imagination claims its own claims its own rights. I'm really very interested in Manuel and I. In, in, I, I believe that the whole generation of Spanish writers, younger than, than you, have found themselves surprised by having to write about the Civil War. And this is even more interesting because they didn't live that experience. But let me move on to Marcelo to ask him um, a question which is connected with this. Uh, in your case, you also suffered the dictatorship. Uh, you have chosen to move to Barcelona, which is a city that has attracted the great Latin American writers for decades. In your own personal case, why did you do that? Uh, uh, by choice and free will, and, and with much uh, joy in my case. I, I didn't have to endure the, the need to, to be exiled as many of my uh, older 
colleagues uh, I've mentioned before, Cortázar, for example. Uh, there are many reasons, personal reasons, that I, 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 I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, no, yes, but uh, I think what, what, what is pertinent here is the fact, good or bad, but fact in the end that Spain has become uh, the heart and the center of the, the, the literature uh, written in Spanish. Uh, and in, it has to do, uh, in many ways, uh, it has to do with, with, a, with a, uh, an economical crisis in Latin America during the, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Argentina, for many, many years, uh, had a tradition of strong uh, and independent publishing houses from uh, MSC and Sudamericana, uh, the, the, the publishing houses that, that discovered uh, Borges, Cortázar, Sabato. Uh, Garcia Marquez, uh, but uh, during the, the, the 90s, uh, the, the reality of, of the, of, of the uh, economical crisis uh, that led uh, these publishing houses, uh, some of them uh, to close shops uh, and then others of them to be bought by uh, international firms uh, like Mondadori or uh, or whatever. So, what we have is in, in our countries uh, very very strong uh, publishing houses like uh, Alfaguara, Planeta. Uh, but uh, they are in almost all our countries, from Mexico to Argentina and Chile, and even in Brazil now. Uh, and. Uh, they are the ones that uh, th that matter, a and what happens sometimes is uh, many times is uh, the, the the one each of these publishing houses uh, the authors that they publish in Argentina they don't publish them in Chile or Mexico or Peru or and whatever or Colombia on on the on, the authors that they publish in Colombia, we don't know them in Argentina and Chile. Uh, so, uh, the, basically, the, the only way to meet some other writers uh, is traveling uh, or, or living in Barcelona. For <laughs> that is sadly true. And uh, let me ask you one more question, which is connected with some of the topics at the, uh, the table, which is. As a witness of the situation, being a Latin American living in Catalonia, from the outside, how do you see the relationship between the two languages and the two cultures, Catalan and Castilian? Uh, I, I see a strong struggle. Uh, so, in, in a way, for me, it's, it, it, it is easy to understand Teresa because even though I'm, I'm beginning to learn Catalan slowly, but uh, I have this this strange feeling that I write in Spanish uh, but in a way I'm, I'm a foreigner uh, in my in my own language uh, I don't know I think for the first time in a way living in some other country uh, I think that that's that's the way I always felt living in Argentina also as, as Foreigner is something that uh, really uh, doesn't uh, belong. But uh, moving back to to, to the, the Catalan Spanish thing, but I see the I see the, the, the struggle, uh, and, and uh, I relate very strongly to, to this uh, experience of not having being able to speak your own language. Uh, but, outside the door of your own house. You know, that kind of violence is a violence that I know very well, so uh, I am sympathetic and I, and I would like very much that, that uh, Catalonia and the rest of Spain could find a, a, a less dramatic way to relate to each other.
uh, I was going to ask Serna uh, the same question I asked you before because I think it's really very important and almost tragic the fact the way in which writers published by Anagrama or whoever uh, uh, this is terrible because the publishing houses publish you and there is this Anagrama which is great or Afawaro, Toledo, Bidisa, Argentina and then no one knows what's going on with you in Colombia or Mexico so I was going to ask you specifically whether how do you see that yourself because I think it's very important uh, in, in connection also with the fact that he said that he's an, exi an economic exile almost as a writer having to go to Spain because otherwise he is isolated from himself well I know many excellent writers in many Latin American countries that they are only known in their own countries. Sometimes they are talented in French and German, and they are known in, in those countries, but they are not known in, in other in the, uh, Spanish speaker countries. It's, it's uh, illogical. And I think that this is contributing to isolate our national uh, cultures. Uh, in the 60s, when the Latin American publishers were uh, stronger, where in Mexico we had uh, Joaquin Ortiz, uh, Fondo de Cultura Económica, uh, Siglo XXI, the era, for instance, and, and in Argentina, they had uh, MSC, Sudamericana, Losada, and many other important uh, publishers. Maybe uh, we had more communication between our countries and that why, that, that, that the way that uh, produced the boom, the Latin American boom, you know, because we must remember that, for instance, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez publishes Cien Años de Soledad in Sudamericana, you know, firstly. Then, uh, an, a very important Spanish editor, Carlos Barral, who publishes Manuel de Lope, uh, uh, he launched many other important writers, and he uh, realized that it was a, a important uh, literature and uh, he was very important to, to make uh, the international success of, uh, of the boom but it began in, in Latin America and in, in the Latin American publishers and I think that uh, the problem is that there is not enough uh, intellectual curiosity to, to try to know who is uh, writing in, 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 in Venezuela in, uh, in, and the only way I, I agree uh, with you is that uh, traveling because it's the only way to know other people to see w w which w w what are the important authors uh, everywhere because uh, the continental uh, distribution is reserved for a for a very small group uh, of writers some of them are great writers of course like Roberto Bolaño, uh, Laura Restrepo, uh, the Salvadorian uh, novelist uh, Moya, Moya Castellanos, it is an excellent. Uh, another Chilean that presented yesterday a book, Carlos Franz. No? Uh, but uh, many others are only known in, in their countries. For instance, in the Mexican literature, we have many classics that are only known uh, for our people. Like, for instance, Martin Luis Guzman, Jose Revueltas. Uh, I, I, I am afraid that these names don't say anything to you. But uh, they are really great writers that never have uh, had international uh, uh, distribution. What what usually ends happening is you find uh, a bigger affinity with another Latin American writer that you find uh, uh, in whatever you go that with your own. Uh, in, in my case, Argentinian writers. I, I think I, I feel. Uh, near, for instance, Juan Gabriel Vázquez, which is a, 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 a Colombian writer, than many Argentinian writers of, of my age. Well, um, something that uh, Teresa said before about wishing, willing to reach a wider readership brings to mind something which is very important. I really believe that uh, this festival is very political, the Pen Festival. And I really believe that we writers must do something to fight certain forms of control. One of them is by the publishing giants. I mean, and uh, from outer control, which was the political situation before, to the inner control. And I am speaking now as a writer. Is when you meet with your publishers, 
books I did recently, and they said, well, so what is, are you, what is your novel, next novel going to be like? They want to know, are we going to sell it or not? Now, honestly, really honestly, inside yourselves, how do, I, how do you address that issue of willing to have more readers? Because I believe that a writer should be only faithful to his own imagination, ethically, but who does not want to sell? So how do you approach that, any of you? Well, in my case, I, in my case, I, I had an experience with one of my foreign publishers that, uh, well, they put to change the end of the novel because they they think that it was not uh, moral, or I mean, <laughs> so uh, and it was an, an, to me uh, an, an important publisher. And, 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 and I had the temptation, no? But at the end I decided uh, not to change the, my novel. And uh, several months uh, later uh, they decided to publish the novel with the books. Yes. But I, I, yeah, I think the, now the relationship of the writers and the publishing houses is is very difficult, especially with the big ones, because you 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 can still find some small publishers that really like literature and books, but what you usually find is publishers that are uh, executives. I mean, they don't like literature. They are also interested in, in sales. Uh, uh, so, and, and if you write in a minority language, as Catalan, that is true that in Catalan we have a, a big community of readers. No? We are probably, I don't know, uh, 10, 11 millions, but People that can really read Catalan are less, you know, I think. And on the other hand, we have the problem that uh, in the Spanish market, uh, they don't like at all to read Catalan translations. Not only Catalan, but also uh, uh, people that rise in Galician or, or people from, uh, in, or in Euskera, no, in Basque. So I, I don't know why, but it's a tradition that uh, Spanish readers don't like to read translation from the periphery languages, no? So the, the, the difficulties in this case are double. No? Uh, but I agree that we uh, writers, we, we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be loyal to, to our believings. And if not, we can do other things, not right. I mean, no. I, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the relationship with the publishers. <laughs> Well, it's possible writers have changed a lot. Pero los editores han cambiado mucho más. But publishers have changed much more than they have. Hay un abismo desde el momento en que yo comencé a publicar. There is a gap from the time I started publishing. A la relación editorial que se vive hoy día. Uh, and the relationship then, as compared to the relationship that uh, we have with publishers today. Cuando yo era joven, la, la relación era una relación personal. When I was young, the relationship was more personal. Se vivían de cerca muchas cosas. You lived many things closely. Y actualmente es una relación eh, muchísimo más eh, de negocio, administrativo. But uh, today the relationship is much more business-like. It's more like an administrative. Yo puedo decir que a muchos, mis, a muchos de mis editores no los conozco. I can even tell you, I don't know many of my publishers. Esto era imposible hace 30 años. Which 30 years ago was unheard of. 
pero tengo que hacer una excepción precisamente con, con mis editores americanos. Although there is the exception with my American publishers. Con la editorial Other Press. Other Press, the publishing house. Tengo una relación personal. I have a personal relationship with it. Tanto con su directora como con varios de sus miembros. With their members and uh, its director. Y es una relación que me recuerda un poco a la de mis comienzos and this relationship reminds me of when I began to, uh, my una, career as a writer I think however that's an exception rather than the rule and it uh, rejuvenates me somehow you know, but you know, you know what Manuel uh, that's exactly what I was talking about before these are the small presses which are really heroic and so what they have done is, is recover the past and so I think that we have the duty to, to continue to fight uh, along those lines. So it's like the, the director of uh, Dalkey Archive Press, there was a panel before, there was a profile about him and, and John O'Brien, and they said, the man who would forbid all happy endings. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 I really think we have to be sure, yes. No, well, because uh, I, I thought maybe many people doesn't know that uh, the figure of the editor, as, as uh, you, you know it here in America and in, in, in Britain, uh, uh, the, the, the guy or the woman that uh, works with your text and, and that, that pesters you and questions you and, and tries to, uh, to uh, the, the give birth to an even better text, it doesn't exist in Hispano America, in the Latin American Spanish speaking world. Uh, so uh, the, the, the relationship is really more. Uh, uh, like Manuel was saying, just kind of uh, business-like, uh, and it, it has nothing to do with uh, working together towards uh, a better novel to a better book. My my German publisher uh, would like to change the the title of the novel, A Shortcut to Paradise, and title uh, Death. Dance Sardanas. <laughs> Sardana is. Yes, uh, no curse. Yes, it's, it's a traditional <laughs> Catalonia dance, no? <laughs> and I, I said, well, in my novel, there are any Sardana, no? Uh, oh, it, it doesn't matter because uh, German people likes very much Catalonia and knows what is Sardana. So if you put Death Dan Sardana, the book will will be sell, no? We'll sell it with a CD. Oh, my God. <laughs> and they eat paella too, right? Yes. <laughs> of course, I refuse. <laughs> Don't remind me the people of a movie by Woody Allen, no? Big Cristina Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. Like, I can't understand why. <laughs> I, in the previous panel, which was very interesting about the contemporary, uh, the best European fiction, there was a very interesting writer from Moldova, Moldavia, I think, who the moderator asked him about postmodernism and techniques of experimentalism, and he said he was really great. He said, "I don't know about the United States, but in Moldavia, <laughs> postmodernism is dead." <laughs> So my question to you, Paul, is that in the 60s when the, the world discovered the treasure of Latin American literature with the so-called boom, and everything was associated with magical realism, which I think is, is like Paul Modestis in Moldavia, then, um, is where do you see yourself say, in terms of uh, a way of writing, both technically and also in terms of nationality, because I think that you all, my guess have translated trans transcended that. I mean, so that's the question in terms of the experimentalism or after postmodernism. What? Yeah. Well, um, I think that the um, magic realism was very important because uh, the main uh, writers of that current, uh, like uh, Juan Rulfo, Garcia Marquez, or Alejo Carpentier, uh, uh, made a poetical exploit, exploit the, uh, describing the phantasmagoric reality of, of Latin America 
and uh, they managed to, to internationalize our, our literatures because uh, uh, all around the world uh, there is a nostalgia for the pre-modern uh, uh, countries, the pre-modern co cultures. No? The atmospheres of the magic realities and the same atmospheres of the days of the Middle Age, of the One Thousand Nights, or uh, of the uh, uh, or or the South uh, uh, of the United States, uh, as he's described in the novels uh, of Faulkner. No? Faulkner maybe is a, a magic realist uh, 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 before uh, Garcia Marquez, because Garcia Marquez was very strongly influenced by by Faulkner and also Juan Rulfo in Mexico. Juan Rulfo, Pedro Paramo has the same structure of a uh, structure of Asale, Asale Day in the, this novel by, by William Faulkner. Uh, and well, uh, uh, the, the, the magic realism doesn't explain uh, 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 national realities uh, uh, because uh, these stories can uh, uh, take place in Mexico or in Arabia or in, in India and many other places where this exotic world exists also. Uh, and I think that uh, the task of trying to uh, explain uh, 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 the, the uh, national reality of, of, a, of an unknown country is maybe more difficult. And there are some writers that have done it, like uh, Vargas Llosa. Uh, if a foreign reader doesn't know anything about Peru, uh, after reading uh, Vargas Llosa, he will know uh, about the history, the political changes, and and and, and uh, he will be will be introduced to a to a to a different world, but the world of a of a national culture, of a national, and and for instance, the, the first novels of Carlos Fuentes also uh, had done that, like uh, La Región Más Transparente, La Muerte de Artemio Cruz. And I think that this uh, is an important uh, um, uh, current also of the Latin uh, American fiction. And, but the problem is that Latin Americans uh, don't have the same, uh, the same advantage of the writers of the first world. Because when a writer of the first world, like for instance, uh, uh, Philip Roth, you know, uh, describes the, the life of the uh, cities of the uh, East Coast in, in the United States, he knows that uh, many readers abroad have an idea of uh, New York, have an, a mental map of these cities, because uh, the American cinema is internationally known and many other and many other things. But the international reader has no idea about the uh, uh, geography, the political development, the history of Peru, Mexico, Venezuela, and our countries are known. For instance, I had the experience in 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 in, in, in India, no, when I went to give a lecture, no, about uh, the the Mexican humoristic writers from Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz to Jorge Barguengotia. And when I finished my, my lecture, I discovered that nobody knew anything about them. And the chairman of the faculty asked me, could you tell me something about Marquez? And I told him, what Marquez? Garcia Marquez. Is, uh, and they didn't know that uh, Garcia Marquez was Colombian. And, and I think that this is logic because uh, la, la India is a very more uh, complex world than, than Latin America. They have many religions, they, they speak uh, 15 different languages. You know? And for them uh, to, to, to differentiate between Mexico and Colombia uh, is, is very difficult. They, for them, we are uh, uh, the same world. You know? And it's logic because we speak the same language, we have very similarities. We know, uh, seeing this uh, from our point of view, that uh, Colombia and Mexico are different countries, they have different literatures, but uh, from La India, we are the same thing. That's very interesting because the director of this festival, Salvador Rossi, was highly influenced by Garcia Marquez. <laughs> He's a great writer. Um, Manuel, um, this a question for you. They say, I just want to address the relationship between the two sides of the Atlantic in terms of Spanish language literature, Latin America and Spain. 
maybe it's a stereotype or a cliche, but they say that Spanish fiction is doomed to be realistic. Well, that is possible because I think realism is a deep uh, rooted tradition in Spain. It goes back to the beginning of uh, literature written in uh, Castilian literature. El Cantar de Mio Cid, que se escribió el año mil. The Cantar de Mio Cid, written in the year 1000. Eh, se puede comparar con poemas similares franceses o ingleses. Can be compared to similar French or English poems. La chanson de Roland, no puede ser. Y la característica del, del mío Cid es precisamente que no hay fantasmas, no hay apariciones. And it's very characteristic of the mío Cid is that there are no apparitions, no ghosts, nothing like that. El gran corpus de literatura española. The great body of Spanish literature. Creo que es la novela picaresca. I think is the picaresque novel, which is somehow is exported into Latin America, but I think erudites would know that better than I would. Y este cuerpo central, clásica, también es realista. And uh, this central body of classical literature is also realistic. Y si llegamos al boom latinoamericano, precisamente, and, and in fact about the Latin American boom, Yo recuerdo cuando se publicó en España Ciudad de los Perros, 100 años horario, yo debía tener 16, 17 años. I remember when uh, City of Dogs, Ciudad de los Perros, was published in Spain. I must have been 17 at the time. Fue una gran sorpresa. It was Un a big golpe. surprise. It was a big hit. Pero se descubría otra manera de escribir. Because uh, we were discovering another way of writing. Era algo más que el exotismo del relato. It was beyond the exoticism of a... Uh, of Renato, it was directamente otra manera de acercarse a la escritura. A different way, it was a direct, uh, a, a directly a different way of approaching uh, writing. Y quizá después de esta sorpresa inicial, perhaps after the initial surprise, se vuelve al, al canal realista que nos caracteriza. We went back to the realism that is our characteristic. Yo creo, hablando de escritura experimental, ha habido sus momentos. There has, there have been moments of experimental writing. Eh, Hay aquí un escritor francés, Hervé Letelier, que pertenece a un grupo muy importante de literatura experimental. He belongs to a very important group of experimental literature. Muy activo, muy and vivo. And very active, very alive. Son la tercera generación que pertenece a ese grupo. This is the third generation of that group. Y tienen una ramificación internacional en países como Argentina, Italia, etc. Uh, international uh, ramifications they have presence in Argentina, for example. Eso quiere decir que escritores como Hervé Letelier se acercan a la literatura. So, right, which means that writers like Hervé Letelier approach literature no solamente desde un punto de vista eh, de, de, de innovar sobre los contenidos sino de innovar también sobre la forma not only with the view of innovating in terms of content but also in terms of form y una vez más en esto parís es la ciudad luz and i guess once again paris is the city of light in terms of that which makes me think of argentina as a very cosmopolitan uh, country literally speaking with many traditions uh, mixing their other influences which are not necessarily Spanish, so can you address that? Uh, in Argentina we have no magical realists, but, but we have Borges and Cortázar. Uh, so in a way the, the legacy uh, was one of absolute uh, formal freedom. Uh, and, and it's a legacy that uh, we really cherish. Uh, and, uh, feeling able to uh, do fantasy, for instance, or science fiction, if you want, or, or to uh, mix, uh, the, I don't know, uh, folk, folklore uh, stuff uh, with some uh, realistic uh, approach I had a novel called La Batalla del Calentamiento, which in a way deals with, with the aftermath of the, the, the dictatorship, but it has uh, a giant and uh, well, some, and uh, I, I never felt constrained to be uh, uh, anything, mm -hmm. not a realist, uh, but uh, I guess 
I, I cherish this freedom, this formal freedom, and I also uh, value uh, much the need to uh, speak uh, in any way, uh, be, be it a realistic novel or a science fiction, the novel uh, which, when you change everything but the essence of the, of the, of the story. Uh, I, I was saying, and I value, uh, I have the need to speak about the dramas that we lived uh, in, in, in when we were talking about wounds uh, before. I guess each one of us uh, talks about the wound in his own personal wound. I'm, I'm not talking only about uh, the dictatorship, I'm mean, talking about, uh, well, I was talking before about the economical crisis and. Uh, and violence, uh, the, the ever-growing violence in our cities, well, he should know better. Uh, uh, and um, in, in a way, uh, a very a very important writer for me is Rodolfo Walsh, this guy that I said before that was killed uh, in, in the street uh, by the military, uh, machine gun. Uh, for he was... Uh, a journalist at heart, uh, but he also was a great writer. And his m most uh, important book, which is called Operación Massacre, Operation Ma Massacre, if, if you want, uh, is a book that recreates the, uh, the, 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 the events that led to, uh, to the killing of uh, the many people in that uh, in 18. Uh, in, 1956 tried to uh, do a coup, um, a, a new revolution to, to put Peron again, again back in power because after he was removed from power. And there were innocent people that were uh, uh, killed by the military in, in, a, in a garbage field in Basurari. Uh, and uh, this book is a, a the perfect uh, journalistic investigation and at the same time is uh, the perfect novel and it's a book that went out in Argentina uh, a couple of years uh, before uh, in, in, in Cold Blood. Uh, so this thing that Walsh still has that you can make uh, the most perfect fiction and still keep talking about uh, what keeps you awake at night uh, I think that, that is very important for me. The fact that this country translated so few books from other languages um, is very significant and this festival is an antidote for that. So it takes sometimes quite a long time for them to discover masters of the stature of Borges. Uh, Borges is the, a good example of a writer who changes things forever universally. Before him, we can talk about people like James Joyce, but I want you all to address the figure of someone who was recently discovered by the Americans, who is Roberto Bolaño, and certainly, in my opinion, he is not the only one, but for the sake of clarity, we will say that he is a symptom. So, what, what Bolaño means for me is though Magical realism has a very important historical, you know, weight. After things, uh, after him, nothing is the same. What do you think about that? Mm. Well, I think that uh, uh, Bolaño has the gift of uh, penetrating into the soul of the character with uh, many few words. And uh, I like him uh, very much for that. He made a, a, a portrait of the young uh, Mexican artists of the 70s, no? because he lived there when he was uh, very young. And I like very much the first half of his novel, uh, Los Detectives Salvajes. I don't know the name in English. Why the Savage Detectives. The Savage Detectives. Uh, uh, I. I think that uh, uh, I, I, I don't like it very much uh, the structure of uh, his novels because I think that he 
he many times uh, uh, puts some many different stories uh, without uh, enough uh, cohesion to my taste. Uh, and I prefer his uh, short stories. Uh, but uh, I think that it's very good that uh, an important writer like him have had this uh, international success, no? Because in the last uh, 20 years, the only writers who had this international success were uh, followers uh, of second quality of the of the market realism, like uh, in Mexico, uh, uh, Laura Esquivel. Uh, or in Chile, Sepúlveda, no? uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, they were following a formula, a formula no? and this impoverished the, the uh, uh, literature when, when there are many followers of, of, uh, of with a prescription with which, with a receipt that has uh, uh, guaranteed the, 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 the success. No? Uh, and uh, at least uh, Bolaño tried to discover new ways, and uh, I think that maybe he could open the the way for the, the, the that many other Latin American important writers are also well known here in the United States. For you, Bolaño, or who was it? The thing with Bolaño is the same thing with Borges. I, I agree with you. Uh, that there are, there are not many uh, Latin American uh, in Spanish or Catalan writers that are being translated into English, but uh, the, the few that, that, that they choose uh, are really good. <laughs> and uh, the thing is, they're a category, a category in, in, in his own. Uh, you cannot imitate Borges, and I think you can, you should not imitate Bolaño. So, uh, what what uh, I, I find uh, um, important, what I try to pick as a lesson for me, uh, for for uh, from this uh, 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 history in, in particular, is uh, you have to do what your guts tell you to do, and uh, because what. Well, what is the recipe like? Like he was saying, I, I, I'm, should I imitate Bolaño uh, with the hope that some editor picks? Uh, I, I can do that. I, I honestly can do that. And I, I simply, meant, simply, you just try to move on in your own path and, and try to be as personal as as you can and, in, and have them as your own personal uh, and pagan saints. Uh, Teresa, who were for you, who was for you that writer, not the classic, who really changed things for you in Spanish and in Catalan? Teresa? You mean in my personal case or in, in, in Catalan literature in general? I would say more in general. Well, uh, I think that uh, in the case of the Catalan literature, uh, because of the the relationship with Spain is not easy. Uh, writers, but not also writers, also artists, painters, musicians, sculptors, they used to look at the European vanguards in Paris, in London, even here in the States. So our relationship with the Spanish literature from the point of view of the influence uh, of some writers, very important writers as Bolaño, as if we call it, is different. I mean, I think we, of course, appreciate Spanish literature. I grow up reading the Spanish literature, uh, but also, uh, because we are uh, very close to France. I think in the Catalan culture, there is an important influence of uh, French uh, writers. And in the case of the younger writers, uh, I think the, the influence uh, is from American writers. I mean, in the case of one of 
our most important writers, Kim Munzo. Uh, he uses to say that uh, the author that more influenced him is uh, Raymond Carver, for instance. So sometimes we try to find our models not inside uh, our own literature, because in our own literature, there is, we, we have this uh, 40 years of the dictatorship uh, where uh, it was difficult to write and, uh, in Catalan. So uh, it, it's true that there were writers that write important words, but the situation was under a dictatorship. So, uh, Catalan writers cannot go to the 19th century to find uh, in Catalan her models. And I think they try uh, to, to have, uh, to, find, to find their way through uh, foreign authors and through translations. Because in Catalan literature, uh, the role of the translation is very important in relation with our, our language. Because when we are translating into Catalan major works from classics, Latin, Latins, Greeks, but also uh, French, English, German, or American into Catalan, we are um, working with language. Mm -hmm. So, and I think Catalan is a language that is still uh, trying to find uh, her own so forma. Yeah. Shame, yeah. And I, I think I, I really think it's a pity the way that in Catalonia uh, Spanish and Catalan writers we live back to work. Uh, and I always uh, ask for more relationship between the two, the two writers. And, and, and I think that it, should, it, it could be possible in the future, but only if politicians disappear. I think it's the only way. <laughs> well, that's even more difficult than with the publishing houses. <laughs> um, Manuel, eh, para terminar, y si quisiera que hubiera un poquito de tiempo con la si tuvieras que elegir a un español, un escritor español que realmente te parece que cambia las cosas en general, y si tuvieras que elegir un español, no creo que sean las cosas tan sencillas. Okay. Okay. I don't think these are, things are so simple. No, 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 no
los, los hispanoamericanos. So the expression that's been assimilated by uh, Latin Americans and Spanish-speaking people me parece muy bella. seems very beautiful to me. Un poco vacía de significado. A little bit empty in terms of meaning. Y no lo hemos inventado nosotros. And on top of it, we didn't invent it. <laughs> y lamento decepcionarles a todos. I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> Well, it's very discutible, certainly. <laughs> this can be debated, and I, I don't think I personally be in Spanish agree with that. I think it was Franz Roy in 1925 talking about painting. But nevertheless, interesting, I, may I remind you that Alejo Carpentier spoke of Real Maravilloso. Uh, but we don't have time for that, and I have been a very mad moderator, a very bad, not mad, I hope, <laughs> with the audience. So, uh, we can extend the time a little bit, but I think that it is very important uh, that you guys, that the audience ask questions. So we will take, a, they will take a few questions from you. Maybe the issue with magical realism has to do with the fact that for a very long time good literature came from Latin America and there's some resentment in Spain. No, quiero decir que la expresión realismo mágico me parece muy bella. I wanted to say that the expression magical realism seems very beautiful to me. Como sucede con muchas otras expresiones paradójicas. As it happens with many other paradoxical expressions. Y ahora la discusión sobre el término es, yeah. es inútil, está, it's, describe it's, una realidad. It's, uh, useless to discuss the terms because it describes a reality, it describes it, it, it discovers a new literary uh, current. Pero a lo segundo, al conocimiento peninsular de las literaturas but in terms of knowledge by Spain or uh, Latin American uh, literature. Yo recuerdo Vamos, puedo pensar muchos nombres, pero I recuerdo, can remember many names, I can think of many people. Eh, recuerdo un gran autor mexicano. But I remember a great Mexican writer, un clásico, as a matter of fact. Un clásico mexicano muy leído en España, a anterior al boom. Mexican writer, that was a classical Mexican writer that was quite read in Spain before the boom. Que era Luis, Luis Martín Guzmán. Luis Martín Guzmán. Es decir, había ya un conocimiento. So, there was some knowledge already en el cual la novedad que introducía el boom era la, la forma, la escritura, los temas. But the newness that the boom brought in was the, the form, the writing, the subject matter. Pero poetas como Vicente Huidobro, But César Vallejo. Poets like with Vicente, César Vallejo, Vicente Huidobro. O, o novelistas como novelists, Luis Martín Guzmán, por ejemplo. Like Luis Martín Guzmán, for example. Eran conocidos y leídos en la península. Were already known and read in the península. Otra pregunta, ¿no es eso? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I just like to know what what it looks like for women writing in the various countries. It seems that most of the authors we've been discussing from all of them, men. So I'm just wondering if there are any women who find that they have trouble getting published, if they're encouraged to publish. 
question? Shall I begin? Yes, please. Well, I, I don't like uh, to complain. <laughs> But I think that it's far to explain that in, in my country, even in Catalonia, I think that if you are a woman, you are, you are a, a woman writer, sometimes you are considered uh, less serious than if you are a man writer. No? And I think that it, it, it is it, it is a it is a, uh, a problem that not only happens in in Catalonia or in Spain, I think it's the same, but only in other countries. No, uh, critics, especially crit critics, uh, thinks that literature written by men is better, is serious, is deeper than literature written with women because of women uses to explain other things, other things that are different of the things that men men explain because we are different, no? So I think it's not more difficult to find a publisher, but I think that publishers uh, um, want want to you to write only some kind of novels, no? Oh, you are a woman, perfect. You have to write uh, novels for women from the 30 to 50, I don't know, no? And because publishers are very worried about the audience, the sales, and so on. So in, in, in my case that I write crime fiction, but from a different uh, perspective, I mean, I am uh, I, nothing to do with writers like uh, Christie or Sulactor, I mean, no? Because I, I am, I, 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 I use, a, I use a crime fiction for, for uh, criticism of my, my society. Uh, well, Publishers don't don't understand, uh, and and even for other uh, women writers, uh, I think it's difficult, and they have they have less visibility in the reviews, in the you know. So I, I really I, I really don't like complain. I I don't used to to do that, but I think that. It's, it's, this is a true situation, no? Yeah. Um, what do you mean? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but she said it all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think she's, uh, she's uh, quite eloquent. But in Mexico and Argentina, maybe you have something to do. Uh, well, say, I only want to say something about this. Uh, uh, in, both in Mexico and in Catalonia, the most important writers of our literature are women. In Mexico, Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, and in Catalonia, Cerro Tudela, I think, no? Then they are very important, no? And they, they are better than the main writers. <laughs> because Sor Juan is our classic, and Cerro Tudela also, no? And I think that he's highly recognized. He's a national glory in Catalonia. <laughs> Briefly, uh, in Argentina, have always happened the same thing. The women, the women always had it more difficult. Uh, we had great writers like Silvina Ocampo, who, in a way, had the terrible disadvantage of forming part of the same group that Borges and Miguel Casares had, so terrible shadow to overcome. Uh, one of my favorite Argentinian writers is a woman called Angelica Gorodisha, which is one of the cases that is not well known uh, outside Argentina. But nowadays, uh, I, I cannot do a mental count, but I, I think there are at, at least as many women uh, that, that are publishing uh, uh, short stories, uh, and poetry, and, and a narrative uh, that's, that men. And uh, some of the better. Uh, 
uh, I'm talking really the young uh, women, uh, Samantha Schwebling, Mariana Enriquez, and there are many, are really great. Um, I was curious because you talked about the people who are in the fiction, if you could talk a little bit about the role of the American and fiction. We've been speaking about fiction, so could you address the issue of non-fiction or memoir? Well, in the case of Mexico, we have a great uh, uh, autobiographical writer, Jose Vasconcelos, who is contemporary of Martin Luis Guzman, and he wrote also about the, the Mexican Revolution, and uh, he was a philosopher uh, uh, who became uh, fascist old age, but uh, during the revolution uh, he was a democrat, uh, a liberal, and uh, his memories are of a great uh, quality. I remember another writer of this Catalan, no, Chepla, no? He, he, he wrote also his, a great book of memories, the El Cuaderno Gris, great notebook. Just translating uh, in English. Just translating in English, and uh, they are two important examples, I think. Peter. In relation to all traces that it has, why does not be translated or being translated this time, but that is the meaning of this one. Why, I mean, in Latin America, you mentioned to have that mind of the great mind of the white mind of the death man, and so on, and later, Juan Salas. These writers are not known within the peninsula. They've been translated, but they're not known, they're not mentioned by, the, by, 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 by critics, they're not studied in the, in the, in the Spanish school. And you can say the same about great fast writers or great tradition writers. Um, I mean, what can one do about that? I mean, you've mentioned the great writers in Mexico or Argentina who are, who are unknown. We know that you know, there was a boom writer who everybody knows about. Um, Frank Carlos and Eddie, he has been translated, but he never became part of that Latin American boom. Um, it seems to me that, well, to get back to the peninsula, that, that given one of the things that hasn't happened in the transition in Spain is that the, the, the major writers of the other languages of Spain have become part of the, the reading culture of readers in Spain. I, I'm not totally sure about that because I'm thinking of Rosalia de Castro, for instance, is really very well known. So, unless you pinpoint uh, really blatant cases that he. Rudureda is, Rudureda is revered in Spain. Re and, and revered in Latin America. I mean, I don't want, I cannot speak for a whole country, but uh, I think uh, she's fundamental for all of us. And same thing with Jose Castellao from Galicia. Nobody is forbidden the translations or the, and I don't know. But well, uh, well, it's okay. a major reference in reviews, in, in uh, articles by writers in the, in the Catalan press is Franz Kafka. You can get many more references to Franz Kafka than to the Leda, Lamb, or Franz Adams. What do you think, uh, Manuel? I don't know, because I don't want to speak for I kind of share your opinion, Eduardo. How could I put it? I read Pla and Salvador Esprido, in fact, even during the dictatorship, and even under the dictatorship and legally. So you have to, you have to kind of come into in the middle, not be so extreme. For 10 years I was a literary advisor to Alfaguara and they made a big effort in translating Basque writers at the time. So, Monceau, for example, it's a, it's a publishing house that translates it and it's fine, so I agree with Eduardo. La confluencia de las, de las culturas en España es más fluida de lo que mentalmente nos interesa reconocer. The, the, the 
the, 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 the connection of the cultures in Spain, of the reading in Spain, is a lot more than what we are, are admitting here. In the Bernardo Chaga, and very recently, only this year, uh, Kirmen Uribe, a Basque writer, was given the National Award of Spain because Spain is a country with four languages. We have that immense richness. And uh, the National Award for the whole country was, was given to a book that has not yet been, been published. And it, it's been translated into English. Bilbao, New York, Bilbao by Kirmen Uribe. Otra cosa, otra cosa pienso es que, que, que no se encuentren satisfechos en, la, en los diferentes idiomas de ser traducidos todos. But maybe they're not uh, happy that they, in, in the different languages are not happy because not all the writers have been translated. But I know Alfaguara, for one, was a publishing house that made a huge effort translating the Basque writers. Nevertheless, it is important to state that somebody of the prestige of uh, Mr. Peter Bush, who is a very well known translator, feels that way. So let it be stated. Uh, yeah. If I may. I'll, start in, I'll speak Spanish now. Vamos a ver. Yo creo que hay una elite intelectual en España de la que tú formas parte. Well, let me see. I think there is an intellectual elite in Spain that you are part of. Que por supuesto, of course lee a los buenos escritores reads good writers independientemente de que escriban en catalán en Whether gallego they write in Spanish, gallego or euskera seguramente porque los que más leemos solemos ser los escritores because I believe probably those who read the most are writers es nuestra profesión it is our profession pero yo creo que basta con echar un vistazo a lo que son los currículums Escolares. But I think if only you had a look at uh, school curriculums, para ver hasta qué punto, you'd see just how far los autores eh, catalanes, vascos o gallegos Catalan, están Basque, ausentes. Or Galician uh, uh, authors are missing. Y eh, ya no solamente en lo que concierne a los clásicos. And it's not only about uh, the classics that I'm talking about que desde el punto de vista de la promoción de las editoriales en terms of marketing by publishing houses son más difíciles de promocionar porque están muertos they are much harder to market to, to promote because they're dead y eso, eso les interesa mucho a, los, a las And editoriales you know, uh, publishing houses are very interested in that pero eh, in incluso los, los autores eh, vivos, contemporáneos but even live contemporary authors nunca consiguen eh, un nivel de lectores are never able to get the amount of readers en España del que consiguen eh, en Spain en Italia o en, o en Alemania o such incluso as what they en, get in Italy, Germany in or even in English entonces a mí, a mí me gustaría mucho que esa situación no fuera así y poder compartir vuestro, vuestro optimismo I would really love for this to not be this way and to be able to share your optimism I, I don't think it's a matter of optimism uh, and I don't think I should intervene too much but I can tell you two names that are extremely well known uh, in Spain and this is Bernardo Achaga in Basque nobody can say that he is not extremely well known in the other in the rest of Spain and Manuel Rivas in Galicia you, you cannot deny that yeah. so the situation requires nuances <laughs> okay no but i prefer quantos yes. escritores castellanos se han traducido en catalán but how many uh, writers of in castilian has been have been translated into catalan you have to look at that too <laughs> Okay. Yeah, no. I believe how many writers in Spanish have been translated into Basque or into Catalan? So as you see, it's a hot topic. And, <laughs> and uh, Madrid, Barcelona have had four matches in a few days. The next one is on, on Tuesday. And Barcelona always wins. <laughs> okay, the, the, no, as you see, it's really, it really re will require, like the issue of magical realism, these are very important things that require more time to look into. But this panel is very important because, you know, we have somebody from Argentina, we have somebody from Mexico, and where are the other 
20 countries where Spanish is spoken with, but we can, we do what we can. I, I will take two more questions. Sí. Uh, uh, hay mucha ironía en todo lo que se discutió, según yo, hoy en esta mesa. Y esta mesa es un gran ejemplo de la discusión eterna que han tenido los, uh, los intelectuales. Me parece que eh, la, la discusión hace aparente que el problema es más económico que literario. Yo, habiendo vivido aquí en los Estados Unidos y siendo testigo de los problemas inmigratorios, no entiendo por qué todavía los escritores, con una aspiración universal, continúan a, a, a ser atrapados ¿no? es decir, por ese fantasma o eso muy obvio del nacionalismo, inclusive de esa actitud fascista de querer ser de tal y cual lugar, ¿no? soy mexicano, soy argentino, soy nicaragüense, soy... ¿no? y eso me parece a mí un poco irónico y controversial, si no inclusive cretino, una gran cretinaje, ¿no? I mean, let's be careful with, with language because fascism is a big word. Can you translate it? Yeah, you can translate it if you want. No, no, I think if it's your question, you might remember it better than the interpreter. Basically, the question was, there was a lot of sarcasm and irony here, and I think the question is that uh, we were just reflecting the bigger debate, that the eternal debate about literature, and I was wondering, living in the U.S., Correct me if I'm wrong in the translation. I was wondering, living in the U.S., why writers are still trapped by this uh, need to be nationalistic or from a place or another, uh, when really it's more of an economic thing uh, to be read all over. Uh, did I get your question properly? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that the survival of the national literatures is, is very important because if all the writers of Latin America try to become cosmopolite, uh, to write novels as uh, the marketing industry wants that the Mexican writers write about the uh, German uh, Nazis, for instance, no? this, is an, an, this is one of the new uh, ideas of the mer merchandising in Spanish, in Spanish now. No? I think this is ridiculous, no? because uh, uh, if we uh, don't write about our about the, the countries that we know better, no, we can't uh, become universal. There is a Chinese uh, refrain that says, "If you want to be universal, uh, write about your Hamlet." No? Then uh, I, I think that this is true, no? because if, if we don't write about our, our, about our people, this is the only way that they can. Uh, be, that, that they can see uh, uh, their reflex in a fictitious mirror. And the conflicts in each country of Latin America are different. It's very different to be a Mexican uh, now in a, in a situation of war against the drug gangs uh, that is terrifying all our country, or a Cuban under the dictatorship of, of Castro, or uh, an Argentinian under the dictatorship of the military regimes. Uh, every circumstance is different. Then, if you have to, you, if you want to reconstruct your circumstances, you 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 have to be uh, uh, to, to recreate a national uh, uh, culture, a national political situation, even if you are not nationalist. Because being nationalist means that you you believe that your country is better than all the other countries, and, and that that feeling is ridiculous. That that is. The, the, the source of fascism, really. You know. But the, the, the defense of, uh, of the expression of your own country is a different thing. What I, what I feel um, is that we really are between a rock and a hard place because uh, the publishing market and the critics uh, and, and, and we as readers, we always uh, try to, to look at certain guidelines and certain uh, tags um, that are attached to, to certain movements of certain uh, li literatures. Uh, magical realism, for instance, but uh, if you're a writer for, from Argentina or, or, or from Mexico, uh, you are somehow expected to write an uh, Argentinian writer, ah, maybe he's writing about the dictatorship uh, or, or, uh, or the, the, the drug um, cartels in, in Mexico. Uh, that is what people expect from you, 
uh, in a way, and I wa and I want to be able to write uh, about the things or the stories that have to do with with my country uh, whenever I want to, but I don't want to feel uh, forced to do it. Uh, my last novel is called Aquarium. It's a novel that that, that it's a story that happens. Uh, in, in the year 2000, uh, during the Second Intifada between Israel and, and Palestine, uh, and what what I have uh, received many times is, why is an Argentine writer talking about the, this stuff? So uh, we had it uh, difficult from both places, uh, and, and I guess we, we have to do what we what our, our guts tell us to do. That's it. I have been warned by the organizers that we were running very, very late. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things first. I, I, when I got the first draft of the program, I wrote to the organizers and I said to them, listen guys, New York City is a Hispanic city and there's not a single panel in, um, on the literature of the Spanish-speaking countries. And uh, by, I mean, the, the discussion today proved that there is so much more to say that cannot be said in only one session. So I hope in the future there are more sessions like this. And uh, I want to make an announcement. As you go out, go to the garden and you will see the, uh, the gallery open. We have an extraordinary show of photography of what is going right now in the Arab revolutions. Don't miss that because it really is a very powerful show. Uh, on behalf of Penn, I want to thank you all very much for coming today and thank you to our guests for this intense discussion.